Hello and welcome to our today's webcast session on the return on investment of digitalization activities. My name is Marcel Hagemann and I'm happy to be here today with my two colleagues at the Industry 4.0 Maturity Center, Tobias Haaland and Sebastian Schmitz. During the last years, they were both involved in digitalization activities of different kind at our customers all around the world and will today share their experience and our approach on how to quantify the business value of digitalization. Before we start, I would like to remind you that this event is the third and last session of our webcast series, Preparing Manufacturing Companies for the Digital Age. And we're today also live on LinkedIn for the first time. Anyway, all sessions are recorded and will be available for replay on our YouTube channel. Let's now directly jump into the discussion. Sebastian, you have the word. Thank you very much and a warm welcome to all participants and also to our expert Tobias that you are showing today how you can calculate the return on investment. At one of my last projects, the CTO of an international company told about Industry 4.0 that this is more or less a toy for engineers to show glancy technologies. But we both know from our projects that company experienced over the last year a lot with some POCs trying out some technologies. Why do you think this age is now over and it's now important to calculate the return on investment? Yeah, thanks Sebastian. And also a warm welcome from my side. Um, what we see is more than half of the German industry invested more than 5% of their annual sales in Industry 4.0 solutions in 2019. That's what a recent study from Bitcom Research from 2019 shows. And Many companies even plan to increase their investments. 31% of larger companies with more than 500 employee, employees plan to increase their investments by more than 5% in the next year. And this study was con conducted in 2019 before the corona crisis. And when we believe in all the recent newspaper coverage um, of the last uh, weeks and months, the current situation will give industry 4.0 even a bigger boost. And on the other side, we see that the providers of fundamental industry 4.0 technologies increased their revenue significantly in the last years. So that's obviously where all the money is spent. As you can see on this, on this uh, slide, the Microsoft Corporation increased the, uh, its sales in the cloud business by 229% since 2018. And coming back to your question, Sebastian, we see massive budgets being spent on digital technologies today. And due to that, I think it's time to systematically evaluate the impact of these investments. Yes, for sure. But if we take a look on the market, we find hundreds or thousands of technologies which are related to Industry 4.0. But if we are going to producing companies, having their look, I think very less technologies are already implemented. And I think it's often the case because the business impact itself is unclear. Why it is so hard to be as to calculate the business mm -hmm. impact? Okay. Yeah, um, Sebastian, basically I see four major obstacles for calculating this, um, the business value, the return. Um, the first one is the limited significance of the proof of concepts that companies have conducted. Even if Companies conducted many of them in the last years, and we saw that. Um, the scope was, in many cases, not chosen wisely. I have one example in, in mind where a customer equipped a bottleneck machine of a line with a predictive maintenance solution. This bottleneck al already had a availability, a technical availability of 95%, and they were, were surprised that the predictive maintenance solution could only increase it by 1% to 96%. Yeah? Of course, well, obviously that was um, the wrong use case for, for that technology. And on top of that, you often make the mistake of a too narrow scope for the projects. In many cases, the Industry 4.0 solution does not only affect the process itself where it is applied, but also process steps before and after um, th this process. And that is directly related to our se second ob obstacles. Um, dependencies between projects. Um, they are not considered in the calculation and here we have a huge problem because some projects serve only as enablers 
and those in many cases are the expensive projects and um, the real effects are not considered. And this project will never show a positive business case due to that. And if we take a look at the third obstacle, um, another typical problem is that companies only focus on uh, and, and calculate their estimations only on the operative processes. So for example, the um, Im increased, impro uh, the increased um, productivity in, a, in an assembly process by an increased cycle time, for example. What they forget is all the administrative work around. Yeah? And in many cases, that's where industry 4.0 solutions show their real effect and unfold their full potential. We, now, let's just think of all the planning activities around um, the, the operative uh, processes. For example, the daily shift planning, daily scheduling, um, the reporting, quality testing and analysis. All this is not considered and the gains a solution can um, have there. And last but not least, um, of course we have less experience and only limited benchmark data on the technical solutions. Um, right now, those benchmark databases are started to being filled, yeah, but we don't have um, real values that we can rely on. Of course, all the technology providers um, promise fantastic improvement rates, but an objective database of improvements, that's nothing we, we have so far. Yes, if I take a look at those opticals, I think um, they are really related to a lot of companies because mm -hmm. I also have the same experience in my projects. Mm -hmm. But now, take a look to your framework you mm -hmm. have developed. Mm -hmm. It's consisted of three different steps. Mm -hmm. And at the first point, why don't you start directly with calculating the business impact? There mm -hmm. are two steps in advanced. Mm -hmm. So you first take a mm -hmm. look at a top-down mm -hmm. approach mm -hmm and having a look, okay, in which mm -hmm. direction does the mm -hmm. company want to move forward? Why do you choose this approach to be us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, to explain this approach a little bit more, um, first of all, I made the experience um, that managers do not accept the excuse anymore that Industry 4.0 is a strategic project yeah, and that justifies everything. Um, uh, today, uh, we think uh, that yeah, they require hard facts and before, before they spend money and uh, I would say I have much sympathy for, for that. And to give these managers or everyone who should take a decision right at the beginning already, before we dive into a, a detailed project and estimation, we start uh, with a top-down calculation in our approach. Just comparing some top three or five uh, KPIs of the company with some benchmark values um, and make first estimations what is in this uh, project. And I will show that to you just in a couple of minutes. Yes, okay, mm -hmm. let's guide mm -hmm. our participants a mm -hmm. little bit mm -hmm. through the framework that you have developed. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the first step mm -hmm. where you have this top-down calculation, mm -hmm. finding out, okay, where are companies right now? Mm -hmm. I can imagine, and also, if I take a look in our Q&A tool mm -hmm. at the moment, that a lot of, com uh, a lot of participants are mm -hmm. asking at the moment, why isn't he showing us some numbers right now? Why mm -hmm. is he mm -hmm. starting with such a framework? Mm -hmm. What would be your answer to Bias? Yeah. So, um, I can understand this, yeah, uh, that, of course, it's better to directly have some numbers, but, um, we made the experience before you can calculate something, um, you need to be clear on the entire target system of a company. And to structure this target system of a manufacturing company, we typically use the depicted framework you can see on this uh, slide. Um, it, by the way, originates in the Singapore Smart Industry Readiness Index, uh, which is provided by a Singaporean organization we are partnering with. And this framework basically is structured in three dimensions, efficiency, quality and assurance, and speed and flexibility. And the first dimension, efficiency. Um, this dimension is looking at four major cost drivers of a manufacturing company. So the um, asset and equipment efficiency is one, um, the workforce efficiency, um, so the labor costs, the utilities efficiency, for example, energy consumption and inventory efficiency, 
for example, the work in progress and stock levels. The second dimension is the quality and assurance. Um, it focuses on three levers. Um, the process quality, so for example, how much scrap or rework exists in a pro pro uh, process. The product quality, for example, how much warranty costs do I have. And of course, safety and security of the entire operation. Um, the third dimension is aiming at an increased speed and flexibility. Here, the three KPIs are yeah, the time to market, the production flexibility, so being able to easily switch from one product to another in, in your factory, and the planning and scheduling effectiveness. Um, so, for example, how fast can I react to changes in volumes of certain products? The interesting part of this is that no matter what you want to measure, either your own improvements in your own factories or improvements in your customers' factories in case that you, and that's, I think, uh, what, what many uh, German uh, um, technology providers do, provide a digital industry 4.0 solution to a customer. Now, we can also measure which impact has um, this solution in, in the customers. We are always talking about the same, um, the same set of KPIs and it helps us, as mentioned, to refer to our direct internal costs and performance growth. And on the other hand, it also tells us what, can, what revenues and what price level we can set when we offer digital solutions for our customers. This is a really great framework you're showing there because I use it also in many of my <laughs> projects and I know <laughs> that almost all companies can somehow addressing their own targets within <laughs> this framework. Mm -hmm. The only thing is that all those targets are only on a qualitative level. And I just taken a look <laughs> in our Q&A tool <laughs> and a lot of participants are asking, can you please show us some numbers mm -hmm. how the impact of Industry 4.0 is? And I know mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. prepared there something mm -hmm. and I would be very glad if you mm -hmm. can present these yeah. numbers yeah. to our participants. Yeah, um, yeah. Of course. so um, I made, a, yeah, I had a, sim uh, a similar, um, uh, similar questions in, in my head. So of course it's good to structure your strategic a direction with a qualitative fram framework, what, what numbers can really um, be, be expected. And for that we conducted a little meta study, so we collected all articles, publications that we could find um, on effects, measurable effects of Industry 4.0 technologies. And uh, we calculated, as you can see here, the, the average of those studies and the range of the values that we can find for some typical categories of a profit and loss statement. And yeah, let's just dive into some, some of the um, examples. So the first one is um, we see studies reporting, uh, for example, an overall increased EBIT of 7.3% uh, for manufacturing companies applying digital technologies. In average is only 2.7, which are quite low numbers that I, what I would say. Other studies, um, deal with single effects yeah, that uh, have the effect on the EBIT and they show much higher effects. So for example, when we take a look at the increased revenues by a re re reduced unplanned downtime, so I can increase my performance and output of, of my process, we see um, cases where we have 83% um, improvement, which is quite a lot and surely only single use cases, but in average we still see 39% in increased um, um, or improvements on the unplanned downtime. Yeah. Um, if we compare the average values for uh, with, with other uh, values here, we see a group of some yeah, top performers like uh, the also uh, logistic costs and labor costs in production with 63% and 42% in average, which is really a lot. Um, I think those values make sense because um, these are processes with a lot of manual work, uh, with a lot of labor costs and um, a lot of manual steps that can be automated. I'm pretty sure that in those cases, um, in other categories, the costs increase yeah, for, the, for the technology. I really agree with you. These are really significant numbers why industry for that oh it's such an important topic 
and I don't mm -hmm. see this slide mm -hmm. the first time, but the first time I saw it, there was one figure I find really interesting. Mm -hmm. It was about the mm -hmm. customer service costs. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned the German provider who provide mm -hmm. technologies mm -hmm. supporting also other companies in implementing mm -hmm. industry for the mm -hmm. Why is mm -hmm. the saving and the impact mm -hmm. at this customer service so high? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you're right. So the range uh, from the minimum to the maximum is uh, uh, quite small. Yeah, also even the minimum is at uh, twenty percent. And I think this has a lot to do with saved uh, traveling costs in, in service. Yeah, because we, we can offer remote service, we can offer augmented reality solutions to our customers. Um, and I think what's also a huge benefit for, for, uh, of those companies who really have their customers on an IoT, industrial IoT platform with their machines in the field, um, they can offer a much uh, more precise service to, to their customers. And I think that's why they can save so many costs here. Yeah, as I said before, mm -hmm. these are really incredible numbers. Mm -hmm. And what I would ask me right now, how can producing companies mm -hmm. using those numbers mm -hmm. right now, what mm -hmm. would be your mm -hmm. recommendation there? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, um, I think these numbers ca can help. Although we know that they, uh, many of them have, um, have a huge, uh, a huge uh, spread and they come from different industries, um, it still can give some orientation. Yeah? Um, we see that these numbers can help uh, yeah, to make a first estimation which potential is, is really there and uh, where it really um, makes sense to dig deeper and to go into deeper an um, analysis and see what solutions might make sense there. And um, I think for the start, this, is, um, um, th this uh, framework or this uh, benchmark is, um, is a good tool to give orientation and then based on that, um, go deeper because uh, that is important to mention. And that's yeah, we do that typically at the beginning. Yeah, it's our step one, but it does not substitute a profound calculation. Uh, and that's I think what we will um, discuss also in the, in, yeah, in the next uh, minutes. Yes, if we just talking about this topic, mm -hmm. there's one very interesting question I get from almost all customer. Mm -hmm. And for those participants, mm -hmm who are listened also to our former mm -hmm. webcast, mm -hmm. they already know that a lot of producing companies are mm -hmm. at the connectivity level. So mm -hmm. trying to connect the IT systems mm -hmm. to the processes. Mm -hmm. And from a lot of companies, there's almost the same example why it is so difficult to calculate the return on investment. And it's about integrating Wi-Fi within their shop floor. Mm -hmm. If you just want to implement a Wi-Fi somewhere, it's mm -hmm. very hard to calculate the impact there mm -hmm. because there's not really a revenue coming out of this. Mm -hmm. I know this example, it's, it's very simple. Uh, it's probably um, everyone has to go through and even the costs are somehow not too much. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, if you have from your experience also similar mm -hmm. examples mm -hmm. and what would be your recommendation mm -hmm. if a customer asking you exactly mm -hmm. the same? Yeah. So, yeah, actually I made similar experiences. Wi-Fi is a very good example for a um, basic uh, technology. Um, there are more yeah, like a cloud migration, for example, also doesn't help you in the first place. And um, from our perspective, it is key to have the full picture when you start evaluating the return of digitalization projects. So it does not make sense to focus on the single projects and hope that a positive return will uh, be, uh, uh, can be calculated. Uh, and there are two reasons for that. Because first of all, as you just correctly described, all dependencies need to be considered. Typically many projects generate already a value themselves. Uh, not all, like a Wi-Fi does not. Uh, um, but in addition, they serve as enabler. Uh, for, for another project, for other activities. So for a realistic calculation, you always need to consider a package of measures that depend on each other. Secondly, you, make, um, you, uh, you can make a very expensive mistake when you forget some of the technical basics uh, and do not take them into account when you calculate your return uh, and your, your investment in, in particular. So uh, yeah, how to do that? Um, 
yeah, everyone who is following us um, a little bit longer now already knows the framework, co framework called the Akatech Industry 4.0 Maturity Index. It is a holistic framework to manage the digital transformation process and it helps to get the full view, the 360 degree um, view on your digital status quo. And um, at the end, this detailed analysis massively helps to understand the status quo and to define the logical sequence of measures that are necessary to improve digital maturity. Rias, can you give our um, participants mm -hmm. an um, estimation? Mm -hmm. Where are the most of mm -hmm. our um, mm -hmm. companies or the most of, of all companies, not mm -hmm. only of our customer, mm -hmm. are at the mm -hmm. moment on their journey? Yeah, yeah of course. So um, I think we, uh, yeah, we get not tired showing the study that we conducted. You can see the um, the figures here on the slide. So uh, we conducted more than 70 studies in uh, 70 manufacturing companies and the average is um, yeah, what you can see on the slide. So 80% are currently on the stage connectivity and uh, only 4% are on the stage visibility. So basically that means many companies now have to deal with those fundamentals, fixing the basics um, what does it mean? Yeah, you mentioned Wi-Fi infrastructure. Yeah, that is one. Um, they have to be, um, yeah, they need connectable um, PLCs on their machines. They might be uh, migrating their IT systems to the cloud. All some fundamental work that needs to be done right now. And they all have this problem that you just mentioned. Yeah. They are only investing in enablers right now and not really in the, in the value um, creating uh, um, activities. And the reason why I showed this study in the context of your question yeah, is um, yeah, that it actually confirms what you uh, just said. So um, currently many companies are fixing their basics and you see what typically is on, on this uh, maturity stages. Uh, I mentioned some already. So upgrades on the level of PLCs, Wi-Fi in the factory, an IT security concept, a data governance concept, and on the stage three, um, yeah, the implementation of cloud platforms, IoT platforms, um, investments in uh, further devices, mobile devices. Um, these are all fundamentals. These are all basics. And um, um, that, but that's not all. Yeah. So when you only t focus on the things you currently do, um, that will uh, never justify a business case. But besides focusing only on these fundamentals, it's essential to know where you are heading at. And beyond these two fundamentals, yeah, we, um, uh, we, we see much more building blocks, of course, in a, in a, when we um, design a roadmap for the entire company for two, three or four years. And there we will have, on, there we show also building blocks that really have a positive effect themselves and are not only enablers. Yeah, you just make the example of PLCs or of Wi-Fi we had just before. Mm -hmm. And I know that many of our participants are now asking, do I really have to go through this phase and can I not start somewhere else? And I don't have to ask you because I know your answer because we every time say, yes, you have to do it. You have to follow a structured way to mm -hmm. implement mm -hmm. Industry 4.0. Now the question is, how can you calculate mm -hmm. such projects? Because mm -hmm. it would be very hard on mm -hmm. those single mm -hmm. projects mm -hmm. to get there a positive mm -hmm. outcome mm -hmm. if you, for example, mm -hmm. using the PLCs. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you take a look on our six maturity levels, Tobias, mm -hmm. can you probably show some typical projects mm -hmm. companies are dealing with within mm -hmm. those yeah. six maturity levels? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um, as you just, just mentioned, those two gen do not generate any value. But um, uh, what we've learned in the last two or three years, where we designed more than 70 of these roadmaps, is um, there in many cases we, we have uh, similar elements there that really generate a value. Um, a typical roadmap for a German manufacturing company looks somehow like this. Um, it contains at least some of these elements and they are all based, of course, on what we saw on the uh, slide before. And um, these building blocks that we see here, like the digital work orders, digital asset management, transparent shop floor, they actually gener generate a value. Um, 
and that is a countable value and that that is the basis for our calculations also then when we think of a return um, let, let me just explain one example so digital work orders of course many german companies are focusing on an improved efficiency of their workforce due to the high wages in, in germany and um, this is one typical yeah, use case by providing work orders work instructions further information in a digital way to the employees um, and also by collecting data in the digital way automatically from machines for example um, a direct value that can be calculated um, is generated so for example the value becomes evident in less effort for the manual distribution of all the paper-based documents the increased quality rate due to more precise instructions or less effort for the manual collection and uh, the manual reporting of data um, yeah, these are all positive effects and all these positive effects need to be taken into account when you evalu evaluate the fundamentals that we saw before and um, by uh, designing yeah, many of these roadmaps and by reviewing what we did there with our customers we were able to find around 15 of those typical modules where we don't, do not only know exactly what to do and how to implement them but we, where we also know um, where to look at when it comes to the value so um, what kind of checklist do I have to uh, use when I want to quantify the value of those typical industry 4.0 modules and at the end the goal of this of course is to have something like this yeah, to have uh, for each module um, somehow a, an estimation of the value it creates yeah? and that's uh, to have something like this yeah? know your strategic direction on the left side know which steps to take and how to implement them and also on top of that the the estimated value that's a very um, I would say a very strong tool uh, to manage your digital transformation yeah thanks for sharing these insights i think it's very good to have a look on how can a digitalization roadmap for a customer look like and mm -hmm. also how can the calculation of the return on investment be mm -hmm. i think it would be now also very interesting how can this return on investment be calculated mm -hmm. on a single digitalization project mm -hmm. at the slide before you showed an example about the digital work orders, mm -hmm. how this can be used. And I can imagine that a lot of our participants are now thinking, how can they identify positive effects mm -hmm. on this case? And also how, how to calculate this on euros. Mm -hmm. Can you probably show this mm -hmm. with an example you have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Yeah. let's for that dive into the third step. And uh, here, I would like to start with an anonymized example from, a, from one of our customer projects, um, a machine manufacturer. And on the left side of this slide, you, um, you see, uh, yeah, let me explain what you see here. Um, at the beginning, I would like to show uh, yeah, uh, just the overview of the results. We analyzed five processes <coughs> in uh, uh, this customer, engineering, planning, logistics, manufacturing and assembly. And what you see here is the waste or the potential improvement that we can see per department. So you see the, uh, the average scenario that is depicted here and also a range of a worst case scenario and a best case scenario for each department. For example, we can see um, that uh, in the engineering department, we have in the average example or in the average scenario, 20% uh, of possible savings due to a particular set of digitalization measures. In the case of that company, we were ta talking, for example, about the digital provisioning of all assembly related documents and models to the, directly to the assembly line to avoid efforts in generating all the documents, distributing the documents, and also for answering questions from technicians. Yeah. Uh, at the end, we were also surprised how much effort it costs for the engineering to answer all these questions that are more or less clear when if someone would directly look in 
to, uh, into a digital system. Yeah. For me, those results look mm -hmm. very simple mm -hmm. and I can agree on those. Mm -hmm. And if I would be CFO of a company, I could really use those to decide about a project. Mm -hmm. But I also know this is just an example you showed and mm -hmm. those numbers uh, only can be used on this example. Mm -hmm. But by the way, which options do mm -hmm. we have to calculate mm -hmm. in which yeah. effect it can be um, realized? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think that's a good question because here we now see the potential savings or the wastes in the different departments. But um, basically there are two options how to realize this value now. So, and these options depend on the initial situation of, of the company. Um, the first question would be, is the company right now in a situation where it would be able to sell more and to increase its output uh, or if it already today has idle capacities? Yeah? Um, that's an important question um, about the initial situation. So if it is the case that a company today already is working on its limits and would be able to sell more and produce uh, and um, yeah, um, sell more products to the customers, uh, we can use the schema that uh, I um, that we see on the top right part of the slide. So um, to do that, um, we uh, take the department with the smallest improvement. In that case, it's the manufacturing department with only 5% in average. This process will be the future bottleneck. Further improvements in other departments of more than 5% um, will not help to increase the output more um, anymore in the, in the company. And um, if we calculate like this, we have to take the gross profit of the company, uh, which is the revenues reduced by the costs of uh, goods sold, and we can increase it by this 5% uh, to make the first assumption. So in the case of that company with, an eight, with 80 million gross profit, these are already 4 million um, um, uh, euros per year, which is quite a significant number, I would say. And um, so this is one way to do that. Um, yeah. <laughs> the other way would be, um, yeah, we see that on the, on the bottom part of the slide, um, uh, where we have uh, a stagnating situation at the customer's sales, so they cannot increase so easily th the sales. And in this case, case we have to uh, calculate in a different way. Um, we have to calculate the monetary value of the free capacity. For example, by using the hourly rates of the particular wage group, and of course not all effects are only related to labor costs or additional capacity. Some are also related to reduced waste in raw materials, for example, in energy or for external services. Here we can work with average prices or internal costs to estimate the lost value that can be reduced by the digital solution. And even if we calculate like this, um, you see that there are numbers that are quite Im yeah, impressive and that could justify uh, an investment in the technology at the end. Um, what do you do? You just had that example of a company that is in a growing market. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think this is really quite interesting mm -hmm. and we now want to look um, further. If we take a look on the different stages, mm -hmm. what does it mean? Can you give there some examples mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. depending on our six maturity levels? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, yeah, of course not all the value is created uh, from one day to the other. Um, I think that that's clear and uh, uh, what we uh, try to do is we try to uh, build categories. Yeah? Where, where and when do I see which kind of value? And at the beginning it seemed like a huge challenge to yeah, uh, find all these um, levers and all the single effects in a manufacturing uh, company. And we started yeah, listing up all of them, doing a lot of research. And uh, right now we have more than 160 of those possible effects. Yeah, and uh, what we also did was we tried to bring them in a systematic um, um, order. And for that, uh, it was very it was clear for us that we 
uh, have to do that using the framework that we already uh, mentioned, so the maturity stages, um, because that is the typical order in which you would implement uh, a single projects. And um, on the following stages, I would like to explain which value to expect in each of the stages. So let's start with the first ones. Can yeah. you explain what will be affected on yeah. computerization and yeah. also on connectivity? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, let's uh, go into the first maturity levels. So, um, basi first of all, uh, what do they mean? Yeah, computerization means to use IT at all in the process. Um, that sounds very simple. Yeah, but um, as we as we saw uh, from the examples we discussed, we still have many paper in, in many processes. So, um, what does that mean in terms of value? Here we see the value of digital data in contrast to analog data. Moving from paper to digital version of the information, that seems pretty simple, yeah? but as mentioned, is uh, the case in, in still in many factories. And where, yeah, where some information still is available only on paper. Uh, the second stage is connectivity. That means IT systems are interacting with each other. Data can be transferred automatically. In terms of value, that means we have efforts in the manual transfer or we avoid efforts in the manual transfer of data from one side to the other. And that uh, also results in a better uh, data quality yeah, because we avoid um, mistakes. Um, and we can transfer in a higher frequency, so maybe even close to real time. Yeah. And uh, just uh, a typical example, and we see it in the background, having a connected PLC. PLC is connected to the manufacturing execution system that is connected to the ERP and the other way around. You uh, can imagine how much um, manual work it saves uh, if we let the data just flow automatically. So these are basically um, the, the effects here and typical um, yeah, countable effects we can see in the, in the following categories here. So first category is labor costs in production. Um, as mentioned, reduced effort in the documentation of, the, of uh, process steps. So you don't have to write down a value that you just tested. And uh, also the other way around, you don't have to enter a value to the PLC or to the machine control by hand. You just load it on the machine. This is just an improved improvement in cycle time and setup time that can easily be counted and calculated. Um, also, labor costs for shift leaders and the foreman, or um, what we see here, we are sometimes very surprised how much time these people spend on moving documents from one side to the other, distributing documents, orders in uh, on the shop floor collecting data from the single workstation that, and entering them in, the, in some kind of system. That is, of course, all the waste that uh, can be reduced. And at the end, also yeah, quality costs due to wrong parameters, a wrong transfer of information, and an increased revenue um, because we just, yeah, it's the same effect as, as at the beginning. We increase the um, uh, cycle time and reduce setup times due to that. So these are typical effects in the first two stages. And just, uh, we, of course, we can't calculate that for all effects, but just to give you some example how we work with that, I mentioned we have this list of 160 items where to look for. Uh, for them, we also created um, uh, calculation schemas like you see here on, on this slide. Yeah. And we go really, uh, you have to go into detail with that. Uh, if you take a look on labor costs in production, um, you have to take assumptions, for example, about yeah, the saved hours of the shift leader that distributes documents and the average wage. And to get that, you again have to ask him how many shop floor walks do you do and how long do they do typically um, take. Of course, that looks a little bit yeah, like, like hard work and looks a little bit um, cumbersome, but it's uh, at the end, our experience is if you spend a couple of days on that, you will have very profound um, uh, data on what your effects will be afterwards. Great. It's a very detailed example and mm -hmm. I think that most of our participants mm -hmm. can now realize what it means mm -hmm. to calculate mm -hmm. the return on investment. Mm -hmm. In the beginning of our webcast you showed mm -hmm. us a slide where you mm -hmm. say about 80 or even more percent 
are at the moment in the connectivity level. Mm -hmm. So really addressing that example you just showed. Mm -hmm. But 4% are already at the visibility mm -hmm. or probably moving now forward to transparency. Yeah. Can you give us a similar example? Yeah. What does it mean? Which technologies mm -hmm. become relevant mm -hmm. and also which effects yeah. will we see if we take a look on visibility and mm -hmm. transparency? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, of course, uh, there will also be a lot of positive effects on the level three and four, visibility and transparency. And um, first of all, ex let me explain briefly what, what this means. So visibility is about having the so-called digital shadow of a company. That means having a detailed record of what is going on in the factory, in the single processes in real time and in one integrated database. In addition, we have access to all relevant data, information and documents. This helps us to avoid efforts for searching and waiting for the right information or for preparing reports, for example. We are also able to detect failures and breakdowns much faster due to information that is available in real time. And on the level four, where we use this record to detect cause and effect in the data, that means applying analytics in an automated way. That helps us to reduce the manu manual effort for analyzing data um, and the effort for, for uh, analyzing uh, events such as breakdowns, quality issues, and it helps us to detect faster what really the root cause is, why, why it happens, and we can um, address this root cause much more precisely. And you see, uh, uh, some typical example also here in the background of that slide. So um, digitally provided instructions and information and dashboards that are available in the moment you, you ask for it um, and at the place where you are right now. So you directly are informed um, about what, what is um, ne necessary for you right now. I think those technologies we saw in many fairs last year at Hanover, uh, mm -hmm. for example. But can you also give us an example which effects mm -hmm. are going mm -hmm. with those technologies you just presented? Yeah, of course. Also, we have a list of typical effects here. And again, at the beginning, yeah, it's, it's about labor costs uh, in production. So reduced cycle times, for example, in assembly processes, um, where you have context related and very precise information about what to do. And um, what we also see in terms of labor costs, the reduced personal exchange. Now, of course, it's good to talk to your colleagues at some time, but um, it's also um, yeah, not necessary in all the cases. And I think the example from the engineering department answering 20 in 20% 20 of the time only questions from, from, uh, from their colleagues, um, that with information that are basically available is uh, uh, a very good example for that. What we can save here by um, reducing this uh, necessity for a personal exchange of information. And also yeah, labor costs in planning because um, yeah, this is not limited to our own company. This is also, uh, the, the scope is broader. And uh, for example, asking, what asking the supplier about the status of an order or uh, providing the status of an order to your own customers. This is all at the end um, yeah, a waste of time. If we uh, look for further effects, um, the inventory costs, uh, we can make a much more precise planning for, uh, for the stock uh, because we just have the transparency where we have material today. The quality costs are um, another lever because um, due to the more precise instructions um, and at the end also an increased revenue and increased output of the line due to a reduced mean time to repair because we have the direct alerting if something goes wrong and we can act much faster on, on those breakdowns um, and provide also pr uh, more precise instructions when it comes to a breakdown. We both know from our experience that if we take on the look on the last two maturity stages, predictability and adaptability, mm -hmm. that we both didn't see in any company mm -hmm. which is nowadays in those maturity levels. But mm -hmm. we are all engineers. We are looking open for new technologies. Mm -hmm. And 
I'm pretty sure that a lot of our participants would be also mm -hmm. interested. What does it mean if mm -hmm. I go to those higher stages, even mm -hmm. if it's become relevant, mm -hmm. probably within three or five years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, of course, it's, it's good to dream also what, what <laughs> the future can um, bring. And uh, first of all, again, a brief explanation. So what does stage five predictability mean? It means to work with automatically provided predictions, simulations, scenarios and recommendations in order to move to a more proactive way of managing a process. On the stage adaptability, we use these predictions and scenarios to let the system decide autonomously. Um, both stages help us to overcome, um, yeah, so to say, the, the human's cognitive limitations when it comes to, or when, when we should manage very complex systems, such as a production system. Today, we typically have a multidimensional target system. So we have to consider um, um, logistics, um, um, uh, uh, the dimensions of, of logistics. We have to, uh, we have the energy costs. We want to increase output. We have to want to increase quality uh, and at the same time reduce costs. And nowadays, we also have to take care of um, yeah, uh, ensuring a minimum distance of our employees. Yeah, these are a lot of different dimensions a, 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 a planner has to take care of. And to optimize such a complex system, uh, we need support. And here is the value of the last two stages. Always when a further improvement of the system would just overwhelm a human being, the mentioned technologies can help. Uh, examples, uh, you see one example here also again on the slide. So um, a, a digital representation, a digital twin of a part, uh, you can move it around, play with it and see what, what, uh, what um, implications that has. And um, simulations in production planning, simulations in the engineering and the closed loop in process, uh, process control system. These are all um, typical um, applications, use cases on, on these two levels. So for example, um, we saw a closed loop process control system in the process industry that took quality parameters from the raw materials and dynamically optimized the recipes of the process. Such improvements are only possible with real-time capable systems, monitoring all relevant parameters and um, a solid process model in the background. Yeah. And now, of course, here we also have some of, uh, or have uh, collected some of the typical effects Again, too, from the labor costs in planning this this case. Uh, this all this automation in in the planning, of course, um, helps us to uh, improve productivity in in the planning departments. Uh, if we can um, control and plan our uh, um, our um, operations uh, with a more or less automated system, um, and that helps to to be much more productive. And also in the engineering, uh, one example from uh, the machine manufacturer I mentioned before is um, they dream of uh, a much faster configuration of products due to parametric models and integrated models from starting from the requirements uh, going through the entire engineering process to the testing and to the usage cycle uh, at the customer. So here we also see effects uh, and of course some energy costs, so reduced energy costs due to the avoidance of peak loads. Yeah. It's a lever, not for all industries, but of course for industries uh, with high energy consumptions. Uh, what we also see is an uh, interesting case from uh, steel industry. So heating and cooling processes where you have different levels, temperature levels, um, to optimize the sequence of the orders and to, to being able to um, yeah, exploit this effect. That is something you can't do without um, uh, such tools in, in the background. Um, sequencing in, uh, or optimizing the sequence in other dimensions like for example setup times would be an example. And from the example from the process industry with the dynamic uh, recipes we see uh, due to this closed loop control we can increase the process performance at the end. Uh, and the at the end, the, the, the example, the most uh, 
uh, a very well-known example, because from the maintenance uh, part, um, increase the technical availability of a line by reducing downtimes due to a predictive maintenance and a predictive spare parts management. Um, all these effects yeah, can be calculated um, yeah, with some underlying calculation schemas and help us to also justify to yeah, dream of such uh, going to such levels, level five and six. Thank you very much, Tobias. You just guided us very good through your framework. So I think we all get a very good understanding how to calculate the return on investment. As I take a look on the time, I think we still have a few more minutes mm -hmm. and we can just start our Q&A session. Mm -hmm. So if I would address you as the participants, have any further questions, please type it into the tool. We can answer it right now or if it, those are too much, you will also answering those later. Let us start with one very interesting question. You showed the example of the customer where you gave the different figures. How long does it take to calculate the return on investment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that's, that's a good question because uh, uh, we mentioned some parts of this calculation and you saw uh, we have to go into some details and at the beginning when we started with this approach we thought that could be uh, a longer activity to do so. Our experience with the first handful of uh, projects that we uh, conducted with, with this approach is uh, we are talking more about days and not about weeks mm. when we, t when we um, have a typical factory with four or five hundred employees in, in mind. Um, and this is an approach that is based on interviews. So, uh, of course, it's necessary to involve, again, like in our maturity assessment, the, the process experts. Yeah? Because when we, we can ask questions again, mm -hmm. like how often does it happen that you have uh, a breakdown? How long is the uh, mean time to repair today? Um, how long does it take for the uh, maintenance engineer to find the right document or spare parts. These are all assumptions that we need from the process expert, but because, uh, because we have this structured approach, uh, calculation schemas, we are talking about days, yeah, not about um, weeks. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot for the answer. We have another one. You talked about different branches. You gave the uh, machine manufacturer mm -hmm. in the beginning. You mm -hmm. just talked about process and steel, mm -hmm. and we just have a question from a participant mm -hmm. coming from the pharma industry, where mm -hmm. we also mm -hmm. invented the pharma 4.0 model together with mm -hmm. the ISPE. Mm -hmm. Is there some kind of a limit for branches or industry sectors mm -hmm. where this approach can be used? Mm -hmm. So um, th this framework, um, as well as the industry 4.0 maturity index framework, um, uh, they are open for many um, industries. So um, we typically focus on the manufacturing industry. So every mm. company that is producing something. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the focus of the studies and uh, is a completely different one. So when we take the machine manufacturer again, um, this company does not focus so much on the availability of its, um, its production lines. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, that is not important for them. For them, it's important to be flexible there. But when it comes to uh, cost reductions, they have their huge uh, uh, personal costs and their, their labor costs in mind. And they want to make the, the employees as uh, productive as possible. So, and if we think of pharma or a process industry, um, of course, it's more about tech ensuring technical availability, um, see what effects we have there, quality, and not so much about um, workforce productivity. Yeah. Let us take the time for a short last question. Mm -hmm. um, you showed us different savings you mm -hmm. did as a find out from a meta study. Mm -hmm. Now you had also your own experience, mm -hmm. how much different companies can mm -hmm. save mm -hmm. if they want to calculate the mm -hmm. return on investment. Mm -hmm. If you now compare those figures, mm -hmm. can you say those mm -hmm. coming out from the meta studies mm -hmm. are the right ones? Um, yeah, uh, to, to some extent, yes. Yeah. So, um, as mentioned, we applied this approach for a handful of companies now, not, not hundreds. So, the, it's 
of course limited what we can t tell so far but uh, we were surprised uh, ourselves about the results so some quite cheap measures like a digital um, provided instructions for for the workforce um, could already uh, we calculated 10 percent increase in in productivity for uh, in, in labor in uh, workforce productivity and i would say um, that's really a huge um, a huge increase and that helps really helps to, to justify the the investment and we're talking about one or one and a half year when um, uh, the investment is, is paid so to say so our next steps will be to conduct of course more and more of those uh, calculations with customers to fill this to fill our own database on uh, not only rely on external studies and um, yeah I'm keen on uh, doing more and more of these studies in the next month and years great thank you very much I really know that the interest of producing companies in just calculating the return on investment mm -hmm. is very high mm -hmm. But we are just running out of time. Mm -hmm. I would say thank you very much mm -hmm. for your time. And now I would like to hear some words about also our next webcast, which is coming up. Yeah, thank you, Thanks. Sebastian. Um, thank you very much to both of you, Tobias and Sebastian, for your insights and also for answering some of the questions from our audience. We will shortly also answer all the further questions that could not be treated during the session. Um, feel also free to contact us and don't forget to register, as Sebastian already said, for our next webcast series starting on August 20th. Um, the first event will focus on how to align local and central in order to transform at scale. And then there are two more events also coming up. So I hope to see you then and wish you a good afternoon.